This is my first time at Communicates, and I just want to reflect on what I've heard so far this morning. And I think um, everybody uh, here shares roughly the same values, and I certainly share those values. I grew up with David Attenborough, and I'm a fan of all those BBC programs, uh, just as much as you are. But uh, there's also another program, uh, which unfortunately isn't a BBC program, that I really love, and uh, I'm really um, pleased to say my son, uh, who's a teenager, really loves as well, and that's called Mythbusters. And this program takes people's beliefs that certain things are true or certain things happen. When you do one thing, you get another thing. And it tests them. It actually tests them by, you know, empirically tests. It looks for the empirical evidence that those things are true. And some of them do turn out to be true, but some of them turn out to be myths. And I think this is what we've really got to grapple with when we're thinking about the ideas such as um, getting children out into the countryside um, how should we do this? It's, and, you know, it's bound to be the right thing to do. I was listening to the last session in here. It's bound to be the right thing to do, to let children go out on their own and discover the countryside. But actually, um, is that necessarily true? If we come across a number of hostile stakeholders that uh, you know, tell us about the dangers of doing this, how do we weigh up the evidence to show that something is going to be beneficial and that we're going to do more good than harm as opposed to more harm than good. And it's, it's really about engaging with the, with the hostile stakeholders, the conflicts in society that make us um, rely on, on evidence to make our cases. And this is really what I want to talk about over the next few minutes. I want to talk about not about the, the, the research I do at Bangor University, but about the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence, which is a not-for-profit organization, which I'm uh, chair of the trustees of. So um, if I can make this work, right. What I'm going to talk about, first of all, is why we felt we had to create this uh, Collaboration for Environmental Evidence, an open collaboration of people globally, um, what it does, and uh, Going back to the purpose of the conference, of course, why we feel we've got a particular problem with communication. And I just want to throw out a few of those challenges so that we might discuss them afterwards. So why create a collaboration for environmental evidence? It might, might seem uh, strange, but there is no uh, organization at all that's independent, not for profit, and that actually tries to collect evidence on particular issues in the environment so that we can weigh up all that evidence, we can synthesize it, and we can uh, try and uh, communicate what that evidence tells us. We need evidence, of course, to inform us. That, as we just heard, the, the, you know, the environment is in a particularly bad state and it's getting worse. And there are lots of people out there, including ourselves, who would like to do things... And there are lots of people out there taking actions. There are lots of organizations taking action. But we really need to know which actions will work, which actions are working, and which actions are not working, a waste of money, we haven't got that much money, and which actions actually are doing more harm than good. And believe me, there are some of them out there. We really need to know about that to make effective decisions and make sure that environmental management as a whole is more effective. Well, the good news is that data are ubiquitous. Data are now, you know, there's masses of data out there. Um, ma masses of data are being created. It's almost an exponential curve. There's more and more data all the time. There are more and more primary scientific articles that might be useful. There are more and more studies out there that might help us. They're generating evidence. Unfortunately, um, very few people read them. How many people have read a primary scientific article in the last month? Right, it's not that many. I'm, I'm surprised and overwhelmed. <laughs> this is not a normal audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but normally, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a majority of people. And how many people feel that they've read all of the relevant primary scientific articles <laughs> um, that are uh, relevant to their jobs and their decision-making the, that have been published in the last month. Right, I think I've made my point there. Thank you. And also, um, the problem with primary scientific articles is that there's, 
they, they're extremely variable in their quality, I'm sorry to say. There are some really bad scientific articles out there. There's lots of good science, but there's lots of bad science too. And uh, we really need to discriminate between the good and the bad in terms of scientific articles. And as I've said before, the bottom line is that there's, no, that there's nobody uh, or no organization until we created CEE that is actually synthesizing all this information um, in the area of environmental management. Well, so there's lots been written about science informing decisions, of course, and science only informs decisions. It doesn't make decisions. It doesn't, uh, you know, in any way constrain the decisions of many organizations. In fact, science is, is completely ignored in lots of different cases. And we can understand, of course, that in, that in the commercial world, it's, uh, science is often not used as a basis for making decisions or claims about certain things. And so, you know, what's the best lager in the world is not a science-based uh, decision or claim. Um, whether David Beckham uh, is the greatest footballer in the world is, is probably something we could debate as well. But when it comes to decisions about certain products that affect our lives, that affect our health, um, then science does become incredibly important. For example, in the case of the drug Prozac, which has been widely prescribed and widely bought and masses of profits have been made on it, when we understand that the effectiveness of Prozac or the claimed effectiveness of Prozac was based on evidence that was selected to show its effectiveness, then it begins to become an issue. And we know now that, of course, um, this was a problem of bias, bias in the selection of evidence that showed that Prozac was likely to be very effective um, at treating depression and uh, that, that the positive results were published and the negative results were buried. And this is essentially the problem we have in uh, trying to get to the evidence, trying to get to the evidence as a best approximation of the truth that there are confounding factors in synthesis. We need to know what sorts of evidence are valid for the issue that we're addressing, and we need to address this issue of bias. Um, what, uh, and there are many sorts of bias that I haven't got time to go into, unfortunately. But in order, in, in order to counteract this problem, uh, a methodology has been developed primarily in, in healthcare, which we call systematic review. It's the standard methodology for evidence synthesis. I'm not going to be able to explain that to you, but the but this first emerged um, about 20 years ago in the health services when, of course, there were many questions about the most effective actions or the most effective interventions that could be taken to treat people's health in all sorts of different ways. And it, it is surprising to know that decisions before that time, over 20 years ago, were, were not in any coordinated way evidence-based. They were experience-based. They were based on the experience of individual practitioners. But now, 20 years later, this organization have, has thousands of systematic reviews of effectiveness of medical interventions. It's a global organization, and it's a fundamental influencer of decisions that are made in organizations like the NHS. And those decisions are about effectiveness, about people, uh, about people's lives, but also about how do we make best use of the money that we have got to, uh, to, af to most effectively uh, treat people's uh, conditions and, and improve people's health. And that is the organization on which we based uh, the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence with the idea that if we can do this for people's health and people's lives, we should be able to do it for the environment as well. We should be able to decide which actions are going to be the most effective, which actions are going to make the most difference. And of course it overlaps a lot with people's lives as well because why do we manage the environment? We manage it for our own benefit. So, so what is uh, CE? How does it function? Well firstly it um, pr provides guidelines in how to assess the evidence on any particular issue or question that you have. It provides the standards it provides training for people who want to do this kind of thing, and lots of people globally are getting involved in doing it, but they're mostly trained scientists, of course. 
It's an open collaboration. And it publishes those systematic reviews in an open access format so that anybody can uh, question it. It's got to be highly transparent, and it's got to be repeatable, and it's got to be updatable. So it's a, a, a developing resource of evidence which informs decisions that people make. It informs policy, it informs management, and it informs behavior change, hopefully, in the future in terms of uh, communicating with the general public. So in developing uh, CE, we have had three major challenges, I think. There's always been a challenge in collecting the, uh, the evidence on any particular issue. There's certainly a challenge of synthesizing very, very different sorts of evidence. Um, but the challenge, of course, that I've been asked to talk about is um, communicating that evidence to, to decision makers. Now, there's no easy way of doing this. Uh, all, I, all I can do is, is tell you some stories, I think. Um, and there are some extremely interesting stories about systematic reviews. When we try and um, synthesize the evidence, we look at the evidence that exists on particular things. And the best way of explaining this is, is to think about theories of change. We do things because we think they're going to make a difference, because we think they'll change things. And so all of these images are about some theories of change which we have, particularly at policy level, but maybe at management level too. For example, um, there's a, a question about the impact of wind farms on bird populations. The idea is that wind farms may negatively impact on bird populations. And so can we site wind farms in places that they do not affect or minimally affect bird populations? There's a theory of change that if we put riparian woodland, uh, you know, if we, if we site uh, woodland along the edges of rivers, that this will ha help us adapt to climate change, keep the rivers cooler, and enable the cold water fish, like salmon, to remain in those rivers. There's a theory that if we create marine protected areas, then that's going to benefit fish populations and it's going, to be able, uh, it's going to enable us to harvest fish more sustainably in the long term, and it's going to protect coral reefs, etc., etc. There's a theory that if we devolve governance down to the local people of living in and around protected areas globally, in terms of community forest management, for example, community-based conservation, that that will achieve better the twin goals of biodiversity, conservation, and human well-being. All of those are very big issues, but what is the evidence that they are actually the, actually the case? So those are systematic reviews that we have actually carried out in the CEE. Not necessarily me, but others have undertaken systematic reviews, and they have been commissioned by um, government organizations, or in one case um, by the RSPB, in fact, in terms of the wind farms. So non-government -govern organizations as well, who want to be informed by science. The communication issue, which I want to move on to now for the last five minutes, is that the answer to these questions is not simple, of course. The answer to do wind farms affect bird populations is an, it depends. And so, the, so what's really interesting is what it depends upon, of course, the variables out there in the environment that are likely to make a difference. And if we understand those variables, then we can predict more effectively the impact of something like a wind farm installation. We can predict the impact of riparian woodland. We can predict the impact of marine protected areas. And that's really what we want to achieve in environmental management. But communicating that message is extremely difficult. Difficult. For example, in the wind farm case, there's some evidence that sea ducks are negatively impacted by um, offshore wind farms. And the reason for that might be that duck, the way ducks fly, um, they're not very maneuverable in flight. They fly very differently from some other things like raptors and waders. And so, you know, that, the, the answer to the question, uh, the, the basic primary question of the review is it depends, and then you move into a lot of very contextualized information. 
So, sim simple messages are not necessarily appropriate. So the challenge we face is that the useful message is a complex and a long one. It's also a quite a scientifically based one. And also, these complex messages are, are really burdened or racked with uncertainty. In other words, whoever, whenever I talk to people about these systematic reviews, which we've taken a long time to do, and we've been very rigorous about them and meticulous, and they get so disappointed when I tell them about how uncertain it all is. And you think, well, yeah, that's the way the world is. Our messages are not that simple. And, of course, that uncertainty comes from two things. It comes from the fact that the world out there is complex. It's a very complex world, and nothing is you know, easy to bring down into a simple message. And also that the evidence base itself is terribly, terribly poor. There are, there are, although there are masses of data out there, actually a lot of it is not very good. It doesn't help us very much at all. It doesn't actually make anything more certain. So the, the communication challenge, that, well, that is partly the communication challenge. It's partly about moving from very complex scientific information, like this forest plot over here, which is a synthesis of a large number of studies, um, into something that we could perhaps communicate through with, with non-scientific language and in appropriate media formats. We, have, um, we, we try policy briefs, of course. We try podcasts, try and get people to read them and listen to them. Um, and, and we don't know how effective that is. We, we need a systematic review itself on, on how, you know, how effective communication is. One um, specific thing I think is very interesting to us at the moment, and here I got to um, give a plug for the NERC because they have, um, they have funded not only the development of the collaboration but also a number of projects which we've undertaken through their knowledge exchange program. And uh, we're trying to find a way of communicating how reliable the evidence base is, how good it is, in terms of a number of different factors. You know, how many different studies, how those studies have been designed, the biases that are there, how well it's reported. And um, one of the projects we're trying to do is bring together syntheses and report them in what I think about as a trip advisor for, for evidence. Um, I'll just put up the uh, hotel that I stayed in last night, actually, as I thought that would be a, an appropriate one um, to, I, I'm, going, I'm a TripAdvisor fan, so I tend, to, sorry, I tend to report on these things. If we could get this kind of format, it, do, it does actually communicate quite complicated information about, about accommodation. And it does, it does take into account crowdsourcing so that you can actually get people's, uh, you know, people's um, idea of how useful the evidence is. So that's one idea that we, we are investigating at the moment. And thank you to NERC for supporting a lot of the work we do. And uh, that's our website. Do um, take a look at the resources we've got there. And I would be very happy for you to feedback any information or any opinions that you have about what we do. Thank you. <laughs>